All right, today is Wednesday, the 4th of May, 2011, and I want to do a expository study here of the book of 2 Thessalonians. Now, I'm probably going to be separating this into three separate messages, but um, a little while ago, about a month or two ago, uh, we went through the book of 2 Thessalonians. We did one chapter uh, a week on our Thursday night Bible study. And it really, looking at the whole book and going verse by verse, it kind of brought to mind the fact that 2 Thessalonians is really a letter to Christians warning them about the error of people that teach that Christians go through the tribulation. Um, Paul uh, actually revealed to the Thessalonian believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, he revealed to them about the rapture, the mystery of the rapture. And some false prophets were coming and telling the Thessalonian believers that there was no rapture and that they were going to have to go through uh, this horrible time that's coming and that the day of the Lord was at hand. The day of the Lord, of course, being the second advent and the millennial kingdom. One day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as, is as one day. Okay, so... When you hear about the day of the Lord or the day of Christ, it's talking about that thousand year period, but it can be a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is what starts that day of the Lord. And these believers in Thessalonica were upset because, you know, Paul had told them that they were going to be reunited with their dead loved ones, that the dead in Christ would rise first, and then they, we which are alive and remain, would be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And the false prophets came along, and they said, no, that's not true. You're going to have to go through the tribulation, essentially. And Paul writes back to the believers in Thessalonica in his second letter, and he corrects this error. And so if you believe in a post-tribulation rapture, uh, you're actually going to be proven wrong by this second letter to the Thessalonians. And if you are a pre-trib rapture believer like I am, if you believe the same way, I want to do this study to reinforce your faith in the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, so having given that as a little bit of an introduction here, we're going to get started in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And because this is a special study, I'm going to be hitting a lot of scripture and... I have it all typed out here, so I'm going to go flying through it. I'm not going to give you any time to look it up. You can always pause the recording. Okay, to start, let me make a couple points here. There were only two churches in the New Testament, in the Pauline epistles there, there were only two churches that received two letters. Okay, who were those two churches? The church at Corinth and the church at Thessalonica. Okay, only two churches. And, uh, of course, you can say, well, Paul wrote two letters to Timothy, you know, and, and everything. Yeah, but that was, you know, to a, a young man that was in ministry. But as far as a church is concerned, only the Corinthians and the Thessalonians, they were the only two that received letters, two letters. Why? Well, uh, because both of those two churches are the two biggest types of churches, or two biggest types of Christians, rather, that need to hear about the pre-tribulation rapture. You say, what do, I, what do you mean by that? Well, the Corinthians, what was their problem? They were carnal. And carnal Christians need to hear about the pre-tribulation rapture, because if you believe that Jesus Christ could take us out of here at any time, it will purify the way that you live. Because you won't want to be caught in sin. You see, if you believe in a post-tribulation rapture, well then you know that the timing of the, the coming of Jesus Christ, His second coming, doesn't happen until seven years after the Antichrist is revealed. See, so you can live how you want to live. You're not expecting Jesus Christ to come back at any time. But if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, you are expecting Him to come back. And there there was all kinds of problems in Corinth there was fornication going on and and just a lot of sin. And so Paul told them about the rapture specifically as a purifying hope 
so that they would not be living in sin like they had been doing. Now, the other group of, or the other church that was given this information about the pre-tribulation rapture was, of course, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the believers in Thessalonica. Why? Well, because they were being persecuted. And persecuted Christians, people that are having a really rough time of it, you know, believers that are that are being imprisoned and, and being threatened and everything else, it's also good to talk to them about the rapture because it gives them hope. It gives them a comforting hope. And you see that time and time again in both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, you see this thing of a comforting hope. And those are the two types of Christians that need the most help. Carnal ones and ones that are being persecuted. Because if you're being persecuted, you don't really have the ability to uh, do a lot of, of really thorough, in-depth study. Um, it's very difficult because you're constantly on the run. You're having to worry about being imprisoned. And of course, the, the carnal Christian doesn't do any, any study because they're fleshly. So, uh, as I stated earlier, we're going to study this thing to expose the fact that the post-tribulation uh, rapture stuff is a lie. Uh, the Bible very clearly teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Now let's get started. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. It says here, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know who Paul is, obviously, and Timotheus is another way of saying Timothy. Um, but what about Silvanus? Well, his name is only mentioned four times in the entire Bible. Okay, uh, the first reference is Second Corinthians chapter one verse nineteen. It says, "For the Son of God Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea." Isn't it interesting? that what I said earlier about the two churches that, that had been given letters, two letters, and had the rapture revealed to them was the Corinthians and the Thessalonians. And here you see in 2 Corinthians one nineteen that it was the same three men that were ministering to both groups. Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus were the ones that were ministering to both the Thessalonians and the Corinthians. I thought that was kind of interesting. The next reference to Silvanus is in 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there you see him again. Then, of course, the third reference is there in 2 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. But what about the fourth reference? Well, the fourth reference is in 1 Peter 5.12. It says here, by Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. So he was helping out Peter as well. Now let's go to verse 2, 2 Thessalonians 1, 2, and we're going to read to verse 3. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Now that word there, there are a couple key words in your New Testament, things that you should aspire to as a Christian. Faith is one, thankfulness is another, uh, and above all is charity. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Verse 14 here has the key to it. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, Years ago, I worked as a wood turner, an artistic wood turner, and one of my heroes, I guess you could say, one of the guys I learned a lot from, was a, a British wood turner named Bert Marsh. And his wood turnings were some of the most beautiful, just perfect forms, and I mean, just 
really, really nice. And somebody asked him, you know, how is it that you're able to make such nice work? And he said, because I strive for perfection. And they said, oh, well, then, you know, have you ever created a perfect piece? And he said, no, but as long as I'm striving for perfection, I'm always going to do my best. Now, you're never going to be perfect as a Christian, but if you strive for perfection, if you're always trying to do your best for the Lord, you'll do pretty good. And another thing that, that uh, this Bert Marsh said, said is, he said that a master woodturner is not one who never makes mistakes. A master woodturner is one who makes mistakes but learns from each one of them. And in like manner, as a Christian, a Christian is not a good Christian, a strong Christian is not one who never makes mistakes. A good Christian is one who makes mistakes but learns from the mistakes and doesn't repeat them. Okay, just some things to learn by there. But charity is the bond of perfectness. If you have charity, you'll do pretty good. 1 Corinthians 13, you can read through that. We have a message on charity versus love. Charity is the right word. Okay, it's if you're a mature Christian, you need to have charity in your life. Now we're going to go to verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. It says here, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Now, why did Paul glory uh, in the Thessalonian believers? He would go to the other churches and he would kind of brag on the Thessalonian believers. Why? Well, because they had patience and faith in persecutions and tribulations. See, it's easy to have patience and faith when things are going good. It's easy to say, oh, I believe, you know, everything's really good. I got a, a good job. I'm making plenty of money. I got plenty of food in the ta on the table and in the freezer and everything else. Plenty of clothes. Everything's going great. Well, sure. Do you have patience and faith? Absolutely, because it's easy. But what about when you're being persecuted and you're having tribulations? Hmm. Now, who was persecuting the Thessalonians? This is interesting. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. We're going to read that quick here. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. The Jews in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in other words in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, there's a lot of people who actually name their ministries after the Bereans because of the thing of searching the scriptures daily. And that certainly is a quality that you should seek to have in your own life. You should search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Somebody tells you something, what I'm going to tell you in this study, you should search the scriptures for yourself to make sure I'm not lying to you. That's very important to do. But the Jews that were in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Now, it doesn't mean that the Jews in Thessalonica were the, was the, the, that they were the church in Thessalonica, and you're going to see that here. Uh, Acts 17, verse 12. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Now look what happens in verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Now, who was persecuting the Christians in Thessalonica? It was the Jews. Unfortunately, that's who it was. First uh, Thessalonians chapter one verse six, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now, isn't that interesting? There, another very interesting thing. They received the word in much affliction. See, so you see, the Jews back then, they didn't like the fact that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. They rejected him. Some didn't. Some got saved. Some Jews today still get saved. But for the most part, the Jews are the enemies of Jesus Christ. For now. Okay? The time of Jacob's trouble that's coming is to correct the nation of Israel, to punish them that one last time. But for now, they are the enemies. Okay? But 
Notice there in, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, that they received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You see, that's the right attitude that you should have. Okay, a powerful church is one that is persecuted for the written word of God. And by the way, it's the written word there. It's a lowercase w. It's not the manifest word. They're persecuted for the written word of God, and yet they have joy in the Holy Ghost because of it. And that's not a sarcastic joy kind of a, you know, where people are making fun of you and something and you're, you're getting kind of a kick out of it. No, you're having joy because you know that you're doing right and you know that you're right with the Lord. All right, now let's get back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 5. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that they may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Now the term of the kingdom of God, as I've covered in other studies, is usually a reference to the spiritual kingdom. You have the kingdom of heaven, it's the physical, literal kingdom, mentioned only in the book of Matthew. And the kingdom of God is usually a reference to the spiritual kingdom, your fellowship with the Lord. Um, Romans fourteen seventeen is a good place to go to if you want to see about that. But there are a few references to where the kingdom of God can also mean the millennial kingdom. I'm going to read one of those for you. Luke chapter 13, verses 20 through 29. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees there. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Okay, he is clearly referring to the millennial kingdom. And in Second Thessalonians 1 verse 5, I believe it's also a reference to the, the kingdom of God. There is a reference to the millennial kingdom. And it says here uh, that in Second Thessalonians 1 5, it says the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Now what's that about? Well, Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 8 through 13. I'm going to read that quick. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. That's something else that's very important for you to realize. The word of God is not bound. They can't, the devil cannot do anything to, de to destroy the word of God. Okay, if you put out tracts, if you preach the word of God, if you speak the word of God, it's spirit, it's life, and it won't return to God void. Okay, it's not bound. You can't take it and lock it up someplace where nobody can get to it. All right, important to remember that. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10 through 13, let me finish up here. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Look at verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And that doesn't mean salvation, because verse 13 clarifies it. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So, what's being spoken about there in verses 12 and 13 of 2 Timothy chapter 2 is your millennial inheritance. Okay, if you suffer, like Paul said, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, okay, because he was preaching the word of God, if you suffer as a Christian you will reign with Jesus Christ. And it's not that you have to go out and look for suffering. Okay, You don't have to go out and try to make yourself suffer. All you have to do is stand for the King James Bible and tell people that they need to repent to God and admit to being a sinner before they get saved and they have to stay away from rock music and the Catholic Church and... Just go on down the list, and the new versions are of the devil, and, and TV and movies are bad, and you, you do that, you're going to suffer, okay? It's That's just the way it is. You're going to suffer as a Christian. But if you deny him, if you deny Jesus Christ in the sense of you might be saved, but you won't take a stand for the word of God, and Jesus said, if a man loves me, he'll keep my words, you won't take a stand for Jesus. You won't witness for Jesus. 
you blend in with the world, if you do that, then someday at the judgment seat of Christ, you will be judged and you will be de denied millennial reign. And there's a lot of debate there and uh, about what happens to you during the millennial kingdom, uh, whether you have to stay up in heaven or if you come down to the earth, maybe you'll be a janitor or something cleaning toilets. I, I don't know. But you are not going to reign as a king and a priest on the earth. You will be denied millennial reign because you didn't suffer for Jesus Christ down here. Okay, and let me just say this. You only have one chance to suffer for Jesus Christ, to suffer as a Christian. You only have one shot at this. When you get up, to, when you die and you go to be with the Lord as a Christian, you can't say, oh, you know, is there something I could do up here so I can get some millennial reign or so I can get more ju or rewards at the judgment seat of Christ? No, you can't. Your only shot is here on this earth. Don't mess up. Don't get so um, overwhelmed by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches that you stop suffering for Jesus Christ, that you stop working for Jesus Christ. Don't get too busy with your life that you don't have time to serve the Lord. Okay, that's a very foolish thing to do. Okay, but let's continue on here. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Okay, now we covered this earlier. Who were the ones who were troubling the Thessalonian believers? The Jews. Okay, God is going to rep recompense tribulation to them. This is very interesting. Uh, that's why Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 calls this tribulation time period, this coming seven year time period, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another word for Israel. So this coming seven-year time period, you have these, these wicked post-trib people. They say, oh, it's for the refining of the church. It's to purify the church. Uh, you aren't going to get any more pure than you are right now. Okay, The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. You don't need to have seven years of, of God's wrath to purify you. I mean, that's just a, a ridiculous theory. What you what this purpose of this time period is for is for the purification of Israel, the correction of Israel. God's going to recompense tribulation to Israel, not to the church. Okay? The ones that were troubling the Thessalonian believers were Jews. Lost Jews that refused to receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Okay, <clears throat> and and you know people, well, yeah, but Israel's wicked, and, and the Jews have some weird things, and they have the Kabbalah, and they have all this other stuff, you know, and so they they see the sins of Israel, and they say then we should reject Israel as a nation. They're not God's nation because they're bad now. Uh, well, they are bad now. They are the enemies of Jesus Christ now. They'll put a Christian to death. Now, if a Jew gets saved, their family oftentimes will disown them, sometimes even kill them. Sure, that's true now. But the purpose of this coming seven-year period, this time of Jacob's trouble, is to refine them, to to uh, to for God to pour out His wrath upon them, and to uh, show them the truth of the New Testament, which they reject currently. Okay, the Jews require a sign. That's why God's going to give them seven years of signs and wonders. He's going to, you know, send back Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, and they're going to be doing signs and wonders. They're going to get to see the events of the book of Revelation coming to pass right before their eyes. So God's not done with the nation of Israel. And don't fall for this thing that somehow now the Christian church replaces Israel and and. Now the time of Jacob's trouble is actually the time of the church's trouble. That's a lie. It's not true. And we're going to get into that more as we continue here. But now let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Okay, now when is this going to happen? Well, you can read about the second advent of Jesus Christ in Revelation 19, when he comes back with the saints, the glorified saints. But here we're called mighty angels. Now, why is that? Uh, and by the way, why do you think the book of, of Revelation is called by that name? 
because as it says there in verse 7, uh, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. You know, that's why it's called revelation. Okay? But who are the mighty angels? Well, they are glorified saints. And uh, in the Old Testament, you have the sons of God are always a reference to male angels. Okay? And many of them sinned and fell. Okay, you had the before the flood there, the sons of God coming in unto the daughters of men, bearing children. Okay, that's not a reference to the sons of Seth or some other thing. No, they were angels. That's why they were having strange offspring. Okay, so in the Old Testament, you had the sons of God, many of them fell. Now, in the New Testament, Christians are going to replace those fallen angels. They say, can you prove it? Absolutely. First John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, which was the name for the angels in the Old Testament. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. You don't have a glorified body as soon as you get saved. It says here, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Jesus could catch you away later today. That's how you need to live as a Christian. That doesn't mean that you should quit your job, and sell your house, and go sit on top of a mountain and look up at the sky. No, you shouldn't do that. You should continue to work. You should continue to have just a normal life. But live with the expectation. When you go to sin, when you are tempted to look at a dirty website or to take a drink of alcohol or to smoke a cigarette or to tell a dirty joke, you should think in your mind, Jesus could come back while I'm doing this sin. And then that would be my final testimony to the lost world. I mean, how would it be if the rapture happened and you were looking at pornography on the internet and all of a sudden, boom, come up hither and your family, your lost family members, or, or your neighbors, or the, or the police, or whoever comes to your house first, and they come in and they say, oh, this must be one of these other Christians here that, that maybe this was the rapture. Oh, wait a second, what's that on their computer screen? Oh, boy. Well, they were looking at some pretty filthy stuff. And how, how would that be, too, when you get up there to, to be with Jesus, when you meet Jesus in the air, and you think to yourself, uh-oh, <laughs> boy, I left something on down there that I hope the Lord doesn't know about. Something to think about. It's, a, it's supposed to be a purifying hope, but we are the sons of God now. Okay, Now we have a higher standing than the angels in that we are actually part of the body of Christ. But we are the mighty angels that come back with Jesus Christ in Revelation 19. Okay, and if you want to know more about the study of angels and things, you can listen to our message on angels. I get into a lot more detail than I can here in this study. But we'll continue on here. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. It says here, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now how's that for a the loving Jesus that, that doesn't get angry at anybody. In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, you know, I don't know if Jesus should be doing that. I don't know if Jesus should come down and, and, and kill all these people in Revelation 19. You know, maybe there's some there that could get saved. That's how a lot of people think. But if you understand the Bible, by the time Revelation 19 rolls around, that army that's there, which is a 200 million man army, the largest army ever assembled in the history of the world, this army is going to be made up of people who have taken the mark of the beast. Now, study the thing out. If you take the mark of the beast, you are damned to hell without any possible remedy of being saved. Once somebody takes that mark and worships the beast, it's a two-part system, it's taking the mark and worshiping the beast. Once somebody does that, there's no more chance for them to get saved. 
So there will be nobody, there will be no innocent people in this 200 million man army of the Antichrist that Jesus comes, comes back and in flaming fire takes vengeance on them. There's no, you know, possibility for any of them to be saved. They're all, you know, as good as being in hell already. That's why the Lord does that. Now let's continue here. A couple more verses and then we're going to be done with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says here, When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be... This is 2 Thessalonians 1.10. I should have said that. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now what is that day? What's that a reference to? Well, that's a reference to the day of the Lord. But we're going to see in a little bit here, the next chapter talks about the day of Christ. And in that millennial time period, in that millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ is going to be glorified uh, all over the earth. He's going to rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And anybody that tells you that, that the uh, Jesus comes back at the end of the millennium and that man sets up the kingdom for a thousand years, they are lying to you. Man cannot set up, no man-made government has ever lasted more than 300 years. Okay, they'll break off, they'll, they'll fracture, you know, they'll, they'll split the power or something. But most world governments or most powerful governments or countries last about 250 to 300 years. Why? Well, because the love of money is the root of all evil. People get corrupted when a government gets big and powerful. Look at America. Look at our government right now. It's basically run by Wall Street, uh, run by a bunch of bankers. Our money is printed by a private bank, the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, it's just greed and corruption is just bred in Washington, D.C. right now. And I'm not anti-government. I'm anti-corruption. I'm anti-tyranny. I'm all for good government where the people, the politicians, fear the Lord. I'm all for that. I would never overthrow a government like that. That's the kind of thing we need. But continuing on here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Now it says there, this calling. What is the this calling? Well, that would be the millennial reign of which can only come to Christians who suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple more verses here. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. It says here, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. You know, the Bible talks about that... He that increases in wisdom and understanding and knowledge increases in sorrow. You know, there's another old statement, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> you're happy if you're ignorant. If you really know what's going on in this world and you really can see things happening and you, you know, you see it building up to a very bad time, it will bring sorrow to you. Okay? Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Now, right now is not the time to laugh at what's going on in our world and in our country here in America, especially. Okay, it's a time to weep. It's pretty bad right now. Uh, Luke 6.22 Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Okay, now you say, well then, you know, it's about Jesus and not about the King James Bible. Well, no, not exactly, because Jesus, as I said earlier, he said that uh, if a man loves me, he'll keep my word. You know, how can you say you love Jesus Christ if you don't stand for the written word of God? And back there in Psalms, it says about how that the Lord has magnified his word above his name. So you can't say, well, I love Jesus, but I hate the King James Bible. No, that doesn't work. Okay, you need to stand for the King James Bible. And guess what happens if you do? Persecution and tribulation comes because of the word. All right, that's right there. You will suffer. You'll be oh, you're one of those King James only people. You know, eh, eh. yeah, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get people making fun of you. They'll cast out your uh, name as evil. 
Uh, and of course, you, you know, you'll get that too. I'm not saying you won't get it for just being a Christian, for standing for Jesus Christ. You'll get plenty of that too. But let's go on here. Luke chapter 6, verse 23. Now, what, what should be your reaction when you get persecuted, when you suffer? Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. So you should have joy in the midst of persecution and tribulation. Okay, that's great. It's a great thing to suffer for Jesus Christ. And I'll just say this too. A lot of these modern churches, they say we're about fun. We want to make it fun for people. Yeah, the modern churches are all about removing your ability to suffer for Jesus Christ. They don't want to talk about anything controversial. Let's not bring it up. That's a bad issue. That's a hot topic. Let's not talk about it because it might make some division. You know, they take away your ability to suffer for Jesus. And what they're doing is they're stealing your millennial inheritance and your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. It says there in verse 23, your reward is great in heaven. If you're suffering, if your name is being cast out as evil. Just incredible. But let's continue here. Luke chapter 6 verse 24. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Did you know that the modern churches actually have Christian stand-up comics, comedians? Isn't that something? They laugh. Sitting around laughing while the nation's falling apart. The economy's falling apart and we're in all these illegal wars and everything and, and the churches are just apostatizing and the new versions just keep coming out and the Catholic Church is coming in here. You know, Did you know up until recently here the popes weren't allowed to come to America? I think Pope John Paul II was the first one that was actually allowed to come here to America. Now, not only do they come, but our president bows to him. That's bad. That's real bad. And you have all these mainline, quote-unquote, Protestant churches, which are coming out and saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with the Catholic Church. They're, they're good. You know, they were the true church. You know, and a lot of these big churches are just teaching Catholicism. They've been infiltrated with Jesuits and, and whoever else. It's disgusting. But you got a bunch of Christians sitting around telling jokes and laughing during this time. It's pretty bad. Uh, Luke 6.26 Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now, it's perfectly all right to be loved and respected by the brethren. Okay, You will have some of that. You will have fellowship among the body of Christ. But when the lost world starts to think highly of you and you start to get on mainstream media and things and they speak very well of you, uh, you're looking at a false prophet. Anybody that you see showing up on Larry King Live or any of these big shows, any kind of a preacher like Joel Olstein or Rick Warren or any of them, Billy Graham, uh, you're dealing with a false prophet. You're not dealing with a true man of God there. Okay. <clears throat> you shouldn't seek to be loved by the lost world. Now let's look at the last verse here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12. It says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And, of course, you could say a lot of good things there, but I'm going to end this first uh, study. And we're going to cover 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 next. And you will see... Paul exposing the error of people teaching that the body of Christ is going to go through the tribulation. You're going to see that here as we cover 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So that's it for this 2 Thessalonians 1 expository study. Uh, thank you for listening. Be sure to tune in to the 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as we continue our study of the book of 2 Thessalonians. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Okay, now we're going to start our study of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to get into a lot of proof here that the rapture of the body of Christ comes before the tribulation. So here we go. We're going to get right into it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. 
Now, when is our gathering together unto Jesus Christ? When does that happen? When are we gathered together? Uh, and I just want to make a point here. Read Revelation 19, like I mentioned there in the last study. And you see the mighty angels coming down, the saints, the glorified saints coming down with Jesus Christ. So before the second coming, there had to have been a gathering together. Okay, when are we gathered together unto Jesus Christ? If, you preach, if you're preaching a post-tribulation rapture where the saints and the second coming, you know, the saints go up and the second coming happens all at one event, uh, you're going to have a real difficult time proving that from Scripture. Okay, the saints are gathered together and are actually in heaven cheering the destruction of Mystery Babylon. And that's just one proof, by the way. But they're in heaven cheering the destru destruction of Mystery Babylon that you read about in Revelation 17 and 18. And then you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then Jesus Christ comes back with the glorified saints, with the mighty angels, as we are called. So when is the gathering together happen? It's not at the end of the tribulation. That is a lie. It's before it. And we're going to get into that as we continue here. Uh, but in this chapter, Paul makes it very clear that he is talking about the rapture, which previously had, he had told them about in his first letter to them, the First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. You'll see that there. But let's look at verse 2 here. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 2 says here that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, if I told you that you were going to be facing seven years of God's judgment and wrath along with the lost world, would that encourage you or discourage you? Well, it would discourage you. You know, it would discourage me if I believed that. That there's no difference between me and the lost world. In God's sight, we're all going to go through his wrath just the same way. And now the, the typical post-tribber comes along and they say, well, what about the saints? What about the martyrs of Jesus? Uh, who persecuted them? Was it God? God in the Catholic Church that was persecuting and putting the martyrs to death? No, it was the lost world. The lost world will persecute Christians will you will have trials and tribulations with the lost world but God's wrath and judgment is another thing entirely that seven year coming time of the time of Jacob's trouble is about God pouring out his wrath and anger on the lost world I mean I don't I don't know how you can get this stuff confused but it's What's going on there is that the false prophets were trying to convince the Thessalonian believers that there was no rapture and that the day of Christ was at hand. In other words, you're going to be going through this tribulation time period and then the second coming. So they eliminated the rapture and they're saying the second coming is there. The day of Christ, the thousand year millennial kingdom that starts with the second advent. That's why it's called the day of Christ. Okay, so that's the same thing that post-tribulation rapture people do today. Uh, they were even forging letters and putting Paul's name on it. That's why he said, nor by letter as from us. That's the depths that these people will go to, the post-trib rapture. I call them thieves. You can listen to my studies on that. The post-trib rapture thieves will go to that level where they'll actually try to change scripture. And here they were forging letters and saying, this is from Paul. I mean, that, they're just liars. Now, it is possible that some of the events of Revelation, they, they weren't understanding because that wasn't really revealed until John, you know, in the book of Revelation there. It wasn't revealed until years later. But still, there, there are still mentions of this time period, this time of Jacob's trouble. There are mentions... Of, you know, it's mentioned in the Gospels, it's mentioned in the Old Testament. So they might not have known about the seven seals and the seven vials and the seven um, trumpets. You know, they didn't know about all the details, the fine details that were later revealed to, to John. But the point is, they were getting stressed out because they were thinking, you know, we're going to go through this time that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and some of these other places. And Paul comes in and says, no, you know, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. 
You're not to be troubled. You're not to be shaken in mind. Now, how can't these post-trib thieves, How? why can't they get that into their minds? I mean, if you go through the tribulation, it would lead to being shaken in mind and be troubled. There's no way around that. I mean, what are you going to do when the water turns to blood? What are you going to do when there's hailstones falling from the sky and, and the wormwood and, and you know, a third of the people are killed and, and all the fish and everything are dying? And what are you going to do? You mean to tell me you're not going to be shaken in mind or be troubled? Of course you will. You know, and, and these, these pious post-trib thieves will, well, I'll trust God that he'll take care of me in that time. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's a real pious way to get around it, you know. I mean, it just... It's sickening. But uh, I'll continue on here. Um, they did understand that bad times were coming and that the false prophets were telling them that they would be going through them. Okay, I have that written there. It, they did understand that these bad times were coming. That's why they were saying that they were shaken in mind. Okay, they were believing, they were being led to believe that they were going to have to go through this tribulation time period. Okay, but... Now let me just point out a couple things. First of all, the day of Christ or the millennial kingdom is not the next big event. And see, they what they do, what these post-trib rapture thieves do is they totally eliminate the rapture as having anything to do. They just say, oh, that's not true. There's no scripture for it. The next big thing is Jesus Christ showing up. You know, the second coming, that's what we should look for. No, the next big thing is the rapture. Okay, that's what's coming next, and that's what's going to begin the Great Tribulation. Okay, when does the church age end? I'd like to ask that. I mean, you see in the Tribulation, if any man takes the mark and worships the beast, he goes to hell. And it says, if any man. So, in the Tribulation, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ, but there's also a new thing that enters in where you can't take the mark of the beast, you can't worship the beast. Now, see, that isn't true for Christians because as Christians, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Not so for the tribulation saints. They have to endure to the end to be saved. So there's a major dispensational change. Okay, the gospel of salvation of Jesus Christ, that doesn't change, but a new element of works enters in to salvation in that tribulation time period. When does the church age end? And of course, you know, here again, the post-trib rapture thief will say, well, I'm not a dispensationalist, you know, uh-huh. Yeah, that's why you make a mess of the Bible. Okay, but I'll just say this as we continue here. Don't fall for the lies of the post-tribbers who want to scare you and steal your joy. And that's what they're doing. This makes me very, very sick. Now let's look at 2 Thessalonians verse, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It says here, Let no man deceive you by any means. Don't let him deceive you. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay? So... You know, the Thessalonian believers there, you know, it, it applies to them, but it also applies to you today. You are commanded, it's a command, not a suggestion, to, quote, let no man deceive you by any means. That's a command. You're not supposed to do that. Then Paul gives two signs, two things that will come to pass before the day of the, of the Lord, the day of Christ. Okay. Before that happens, number one, he says there would come a falling away. Now that has, is a relation to apostasy, the great falling away that's happened here recently. I'm going to get into that here in just a little bit in more detail. And number two, the second sign is that the Antichrist will be revealed. Okay, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And in verse four in Second Thessalonians chapter two, describes... The fact that the Antichrist, you know, it kind of relates back to the prophecies given in the book of Daniel, which I'm not going to get into here today. But um, let me ask you a question. 
were the Thessalonian believers experiencing apostasy? No. Paul was continu continually commending them before all of the other churches. We cover that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. And another thing, study church history and you'll see that the true Christians, okay, true Christians, not Catholics, the true Christian church was very small. They were always a very small group and they were persecuted by governments and organized religions. Both Catholics and Muslims persecuted Christians for, you know, ever since the first century. And of course, other ones too, other pagan types of cults. So, you know, the, the church was always, there, there was no falling away. It was always getting stronger and stronger. And the ancient churches, like the Waldensians and, and some of the others, were very strong and they wouldn't compromise. So they weren't guilty of falling away. Uh, when the Protestant Reformation came about, it brought the true Christian church out into the open for the very first time. Okay, Christians were always meeting in houses or in caves or places where they had to hide because they were being persecuted for well over a thousand years. And America, of course, was established as the center for Christian religious freedom. That's why our First Amendment says Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. That was what it was about. And, you know, we talk about our founding fathers, and you think of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Ben Franklin, you know. Uh, they weren't really the founding fathers. The founding fathers, if you really want to study it, were preachers. Okay, preachers coming over and saying, we will not take a license to preach. We will not conform to the Anglican church system. You know, there were a lot of different, you know, you had your Puritans, and you had some Anglican, but a lot of them were just, non-conformist Christians that came here to America to worship God freely. And that's what the Revolutionary War, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons for it. You know, I realize that there were some secular things, but the point is, a lot of Christians came here so that they could have religious freedom. And, uh, of course, after the Revolutionary War, Christians were able to worship openly, and they began to even invite the lost into their church buildings to be saved. And really, you know, there again, that really wasn't a common practice until here in America. Now it's just accepted as that's the way it always was. Well, no, not really. Uh, Christian churches are supposed to be about training and teaching Christians. You shouldn't bring lost people into your church, you know, and just let them keep coming there and remain lost. That's a bad idea because they start to get into the religious system and then they start thinking that they're saved. I don't know how many times I've run into lost people and you say, are you saved? And they'll say, I go to church. Uh, <laughs> you see, there's a problem there. Okay, you should be equipping and educating the Christians in your church meetings and then sending them out into the world to save people from the world. And then after they're saved, then bring them into the church and instruct them. That's what the true church mission is supposed to be about. But I don't want to go off on a tangent here. Um, by the end of the 19th century, though, if you study church history, Christianity was very popular and very powerful. You had the huge uh, evangelists like D.L. Moody, you had Billy Sunday, you had uh, J. Frank Norris, a lot of these guys preaching to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. You know, and they'd go to a city and the whole city would turn out or most of the city would turn out. There were bars being shut down, you know, and, and all, just amazing the power that, that Christians had uh, right around the turn of the 20th century, you know, going into the early 1900s. And, of course, the 20th century did start out very good, uh, but it only lasted about 60 years. And the hippie movement, uh, the long-haired men, and, and the, the movement of sex, drugs, and rock and roll basically started to put an end to the powerful Christian churches. The Leaven, I guess you could say, had been sown. Little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And if you want to trace church history, you go back to 1960, when a lot, when this rebellion really got underway. I mean, there was some of it in the 1950s too, but the really hardcore rebellion against the Bible and Christianity, it really goes back to the 1960s. You had the, the new versions 
They were coming out before then, but they really started to heat up in the 1960s. By the time you hit the 1970s, they really started coming out. And um, you can trace the downward, to, you know, it just kept going down. The church has got worse and worse since 1960. Okay, they went down. Kind of like you could say they fell away. You know, the great falling away. Yep, mm-hmm. And, of course, today things are being passed off as quote-unquote church that never would have been accepted at any time in the past. Okay, you have quote-unquote Christian rap, rock and roll, heavy metal. I recently read an article in our newspaper here about a professing Christian woman that goes around and pole dances like a stripper. She keeps her clothes on, of course, you know, but she says it's she pole dances for Jesus now. Uh, I don't think so. Um, you have Christian psychiatry, psychiatry founded by people in the occult and sex perverts, you know, and, and they tell you that your problems are not sin, your problems are your childhood or some kind of a thing. It's ridiculous. And you have literal Christian psychiatrists now in churches. It's disgusting. They have Christian sex seminars. And you have lost people actually calling in and complaining about the filthy posters that these churches are putting up advertising sex seminars. And, you know, and I've, I've heard articles, or I've, I have read articles rather about, you know, people in a community get upset because the church's music is too loud, you know, and it's not, you know, hymns singing. It's, it's, you go past a lot of these modern churches, it sounds like a strip club, you know, boom, 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 boom. I mean, I've stood outside some of these big, wicked churches, you know, and you can literally feel the, the music beating in your chest from a hundred yards away from these wicked buildings. It's disgusting. But what is it? It's the great falling away prophesied way back there in Second Thessalonians. Okay, that was your first sign. We are in that falling away. But now what about the second sign? The Antichrist is revealed. Okay, before the day of Christ, before the second coming of Jesus, you're going to have the church falling away and you're going to have the Antichrist being revealed. Okay, <clears throat> and I just want to say too, verse 4 clearly identifies the Antichrist as the man of sin and the son of perdition. Okay, you can listen to our message on, is the Antichrist a man or a religious system? A lot of people try to say that the Antichrist is actually the system of Catholicism. Well, I'm no friend of Catholicism, but uh, to say that the Catholic system is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, no, they're wrong on that. Okay, it's not. The Antichrist is very clearly a man. And we're going to cover that here in a little bit more detail as we continue. Um, now, a lot of people, when they read this, they are led to believe that the falling away and the Antichrist being revealed happens before the rapture. Well, that's not true. Um, Paul, In context, Paul is talking about the day of Christ, not the rapture. And we're going to see that as we continue. And now next, Paul goes on to prove the pre-trib rapture. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. He says here, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Don't you remember about this? That I told you about this thing of the rapture and and how the you know the Antichrist would show up and, and how people are going to be deceived. Don't you remember that? I told you before. Yeah, that's what Paul's saying. He's he's rebuking them. But let's look and see what Paul described to them before in First Thessalonians, the book of First Thessalonians, uh, chapter five, verse one and two. We'll read that quick here. It says. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Okay, verses 16 through 18 in chapter 4, the, the preceding verses there, we're talking about the rapture. And he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. A reference to the millennial kingdom, starting with the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is what comes as a thief in the night. Okay, the days are going to be shortened. So if you see the Antichrist show up, you can't say, okay, seven years to the day. No, the days are going to be shortened. Things are going to be messed up. 
So nobody can actually know the, the exact time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you are listening to this and you're lost and you miss the rapture and you get into the, the tribulation time period, you're not going to be able to tell the exact timing of the second coming of Jesus. You'll be able to get it close, but Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night. Okay, And that begins the day of the Lord. Um, let's see here. Now, notice in the next couple of verses, we're going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 down through a couple more. And you'll notice the distinction between saved and lost. Okay, the saved, you'll see it, they'll, they'll be called ye, you, we, us. The lost are they, them, and others. Okay, keep listening to this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, what are Christians escaping from? That's a question I like to ask these post-trib rapture thieves. You know, if we go up right at the second coming, we go up, we turn around, come right back down, what did we escape from? We just went through the whole tribulation. See, it doesn't work out. No, the people here, the they and the them in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, it's talking about the lost world. They want peace and safety, but sudden destruction cometh upon them. Now look at verse 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Okay? True Christians are going to have a love for the truth. And we're going to see more of that as we continue here. But uh, let me just read a couple more things here. And we can see things clearly. By the way, it talks about you're not of the, the uh, night, we're of the day. We can see things clearly because we have the Word of God, the written Word of God, the King James Bible. And Psalm 119, verse 105, very well-known verse, says about, you know, thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we can see things because we have God's word in English. You don't have to go back to Greek and Hebrew. We have the word of God for us in English, and it tells us exactly what's going to happen. So we're not in darkness. You know, it's amazing to me how all this stuff can be happening in the world right now, tornadoes and earthquakes and all kinds of horrible things, and yet the lost world, they just don't get it. You know, they, they just don't understand that we're getting very close to the Bible being fulfilled here. We're getting close to the book of Revelation happening. You know, they just don't understand. Why? Well, because they don't have the Word of God. And they don't have the Holy Spirit within them to help them, help them to discern what's going on. Just amazing. But now look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10. It says here, For God hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake, we which are alive and remain, or sleep, the dead in Christ shall rise first, we should live together with Him. Again, talking about the rapture. I mean, it's just amazing. I, I just don't know how you can't get that. Okay? And, you know, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. What's that talking about? Well, it's talking about going to be with the Lord through the time of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and then coming back and ruling and reigning with him and glorifying him for a thousand years here on this earth. And that's before we enter eternity. It's a good thing to be a Christian, isn't it? Um, but Paul was clearly frustrated with the Thessalonians because they had forgotten what he told them back there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And four, too, you know, as, as well. And now remember, the two things we covered earlier, the falling away and the Antichrist being revealed, and Paul now in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, now he goes back and he says, 
okay, now I'm going to tell you what's going to stop the Antichrist from showing up. And he goes into that, what events have to take place before the Antichrist can be revealed. So let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Paul says here, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Now what does it mean, he might be revealed in his time? Well, I believe that the he there is a reference to the Antichrist. He is the one that, you know, to be revealed. And the his time is a reference to the body of Christ in the church age. Okay, what's stopping the Antichrist from showing up in the church age? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, the word letteth there means to hinder or to stop, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, what's this thing about being taken out of the way? The Antichrist can't show up until somebody's taken out of the way. The he who now letteth. Who's the he who now letteth? What's going on there? Well, I believe it's the body of Christ. And I'm not going to go into the thing, well, me and him, is it the Holy Spirit? No, I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit because you have 144,000 that are sealed in the tribulation that are going around, you know, witnessing and whatever. You have the two witnesses. And, of course, you have tribulation saints uh, who are being slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit, and he's all, the Holy Spirit's also omnipresent. So I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit. I believe that the he who now letteth, the, the thing that's stopping the Antichrist from showing up, is the body of Christ. I firmly believe that. Okay? Um, and it's kind of interesting because you read through the book of Revelation, if you don't believe what I'm saying here, read through the book of Revelation and show me one time during the tribulation where Jesus Christ and the Antichrist are on the earth at the same time. And you say, well, yeah, but, you know, Christians and things, they're down here. No, they're not. Because, you see, when Paul was persecuting Christians, Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You see, in a sense, the body of Christ is still on the earth. Pretty interesting stuff. And of course, I, I'm not going to get into all that detail there. I've said about it in other messages. You can listen to those. Okay, we are members of Christ's body. So we, the Antichrist can't show up until we are removed. And another way that you can prove this very easily is by going to Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, where it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Now look at this. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. These aren't just Old Testament Jews. There's a group of people in heaven that are redeemed out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Well, who is that? That's Christians. Verse 10 and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, we covered that in the last study, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. If you suffer, you will reign with Christ. It's talking about Christians. Okay, so you have this group in heaven before the Antichrist is revealed in Revelation chapter 6. I mean, it's it's just so clear. I don't I don't understand how these post trib rapture thieves can miss this stuff. Okay, just incredible. But we'll continue on here. Second Thessalonians chapter two verses nine and ten. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now remember, the body of Christ is removed. We are taken away, and then the Antichrist is revealed. And that's who is being spoken about here. Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You're, I mean, I, it, it's just so plain. You know, Christians are removed. We are taken away. We are the ones that are letting. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then the Antichrist is revealed. And who's left here? The ones that receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. 
the lost world is going to enter into the tribulation. Christians won't. The body of Christ is not going to be here for God to pour out wrath on. It's just so clear, people. I, man. <laughs> but again, you can notice the distinction between the saved and the lost. As I've said before, Paul is clearly describing the lost world which misses the rapture and enters into the great tribulation. Okay? Man. And now we're going to focus on the last part of verse 10 because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now look at what happens here in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 through 12. And for this cause, what cause? They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Is this talking about the body of Christ? I mean, how, how could you fall for that? No, it's not talking about the body of Christ. But what is this strong delusion that's mentioned there? Well, I believe that the Antichrist is going to be a perfect counterfeit of what people think Jesus Christ looks like and what Jesus Christ is supposed to be. I believe that the strong delusion is going to be a man, a, a demonic being, okay, um, it's kind of interesting because, because Judas Iscariot, Jesus called him a devil. He didn't say he's possessed with devils. He said he is a devil. And when Judas Iscariot commits suicide, it actually says there in the book of Acts that he went to his own place. Very interesting. It's a different study I can't get into right now. But I believe that the Antichrist is going to be a supernatural being, kind of Satan manifest in the flesh. He's going to be a very, very powerful man, very convincing. And I think he's going to be this guy with the long black hair and the beard and everything. And, and he's going to walk around in white robes and people are going to think he's Jesus Christ. And think of the fanaticism that would come as a result of that. Think of the delusion that would come with all these people. And, and again, the post-trib rapture thieves are working right into this system. And you say, well, how's that? How are they working into the system? They're working into the system because they're eliminating the rapture. And they're saying Jesus is coming back, the second coming. They're not saying the Christians leave first. They're saying, no, we're going to be here, the second coming, Jesus is coming. And you have a lot of these post-trib rapture thieves that are saying the next big thing to happen is Jesus Christ comes back to the earth. And when the Antichrist shows up, those that are lost are going to say, he's here. It's the second coming. Jesus Christ has come back to the earth. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to worship him. And they're going to take the mark. And they're going to be damned. God shall send them strong delusion because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Okay? It's just as simple as that, folks. And, uh, of course, you're going to have billions of people saved. That's why you see, you know, basically half the world's population is going to be killed during that tribulation time period. And uh, you say, well, you know, how close are we to it? Well, there's actually some false Christs appearing already. There's a man named Vesarian. I made mention of him in Sunday's sermon. And I'm going to be doing a message, Lord willing, this week, later this week. Uh, he's a Russian, a demented Russian Antichrist, lowercase a, he's not the Antichrist, he's just an Antichrist. But he's going around teaching people that he's Jesus Christ. He's wearing long white robes and red robes and things and sandals. And and he looks just like the paintings, you know, which I don't think, you know, the guy in those paintings, I don't, th I don't believe he's Jesus Christ. I believe he's a Catholic counterfeit, you know. Kind of interesting, wouldn't it be something if the Catholic artists had been painting the Antichrist for almost 2,000 years? Wouldn't that be something? You know, I, I seriously doubt that Jesus Christ was sitting around posing for paintings when he was here on the earth. I think he had a few more important things to do. But um, watch out for these professing Christians who have a hatred for biblical truth. Uh, watch out for that. I mean, there's some Christians that are carnal, that can be deceived. I understand that. You know, you don't have to believe exactly the way I believe, you know, to be saved. You know, I have, I have more grace than that. 
But when you meet one that just is totally closed-minded, doesn't want to hear about it, and just is malicious towards the truth, it hates the truth, I think you're dealing with a false convert there. But we'll continue here, hit a couple more verses, and then we're done with 2 Thessalonians. Uh, we're going to go to verse 13, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. It says, But we are bound to give thanks always for, to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Okay? Again, look at the clear distinction Paul makes between saved and and lost. The lost world rejects the truth. The saved Christians accept the truth. They believe the truth. Okay? And they are beloved of the Lord. Again, how can the beloved of the Lord, the chaste virgin, the bride of Christ, how can she be put through God's wrath and judgment for seven years? The post-trib rapture theory is a warped, and I'm going to say it, satanic theory. Okay? Can somebody, you know, is it, is it somehow you start believing that you lose your salvation or something? No. You know, but it is a major doctrine. And I don't, I don't teach some people, oh, it's not a major thing. It, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I've seen time and time again, and we'll be talking about this later, I've seen time and time again where these people who believe in a post-tribulation rapture, or they, they attack the pre-trib rapture, they get messed up doctrinally in many other areas. And a lot of people that used to hold to the pre-tribulation rapture, and then they deny it, they go against it, you just watch them, and they'll go off the deep end doctrinally. Okay? It's, it's a, it is a major doctrine. It's the end of the church age. It's the body of Christ being taken, being caught up to escape from God's wrath and His judgment. It's just right there. But what is the meaning of this verse here? Verse 13. Uh, Hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. People say, oh, that's Calvinistic predestination. No, it isn't. Because the salvation here in this verse is actually a reference to the rapture. Okay, you can save somebody from a river and that person can go on the rest of their life and go to hell. You say, but they were saved. Uh, yeah, but the word saved is a different context there. And here in this verse, the salvation, it does, yes, it does refer to being saved by the blood of Jesus Christ because, you know, through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. So you have belief there of the truth, accepting Jesus Christ. But I believe in context, this salvation here is talking about, you read it with the other verses there, about that these people are being damned because they receive not the love of the truth, and God sends them strong delusion, but you have salvation because you believe the truth. What's the salvation? The salvation is being taken out of the time of Jacob's trouble, being taken out before that time comes. You're saved from that. You're saved from God's wrath. You're not going to experience God's wrath as a Christian. God's chastisement, yes. God allowing you to be persecuted by the lost world, yes, but not God's wrath. Just plain and simple. Okay. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This calling is to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, is what it says there, which occurs during the millennial kingdom. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. We were over that earlier. Okay, now 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. The things that they taught when they were there per physically with them and also by their epistle. Not these false writings of the false prophets. Not them. But Paul says, the things that we taught you, hold on to it. Don't, you know, we taught it back there, the first letter, to you, First Thessalonians, and now we're teaching it again and reinforcing it. Hold on to that teaching. Don't fall away again. Don't get messed up by these false prophets, by their lies that there is no rapture or no pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? So again, he gives them a little bit of a exhortation there, a little bit of a, of a rebuke. 
And let's look at verses 16 through 17. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Again, you see the thing of comfort. Why? Because the Thessalonian believers were being persecuted. They were having tribulations. Not the great tribulation, but tribulations. You will have that in life, but you will not go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Again. But again, let me ask the question. Comfort your hearts and establish you. Why? You're going to go through God's seven years of wrath, according to the post-trib rapture thieves. Why is that a comfort? You could lose your salvation if you're, if you take the mark of the beast, you know, and everything, and you don't endure to the end. You know, you're going to have to, I mean, you're going to be hunted down like a wild animal, probably going to have your head cut off. Boy, that's a comfort. You know, it's ridiculous. Paul comes in and he's saying, I'm here to comfort you. Comfort one another with these words. You're going through bad times right now, rough times right now, but you need to be comforted. Because you're not going to go through God's wrath for seven years. You're going to get out before then. It's just right there. Now, in the final study of chapter 3, Paul drives these points home one more time and gives a final warning about people who teach against the pre-tribulation rapture. So that's going to be it for Second Thessalonians chapter 2. One more chapter chapter to go. I realize these expository studies, there's a lot of scripture, a lot of things to go over. It's not, you know, this is kind of the strong meat, that, uh, but it's good. You need a little bit of that. Sometimes it's good to have some milk, just to hear a little milky message and that's encouraging and helps you with your day and whatever. But um, there's going to be more and more attacks on the pre-tribulation rapture. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next study. But as we continue here, more and more people are going to quit on the pre-tribulation rapture. And so you're going to have to stand for those things. You're going to have to hold fast what you have been taught, what you have seen from the Word of God. Okay, so that's going to be it for this study. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Alright, here we are, the last of the studies on Second Thessalonians, we're going to do Second Thessalonians chapter 3. So let's get started. Look at verse 1 there. Finally, brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Um, notice Paul's two prayer requests. Number one, is it the written word of God? And it's, by the way, I'll say that, the written word of God, because it's a lowercase w, it's not the Word, the manifest Word, which is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. No, you're dealing here with the written Word of God, which is the most important physical possession you have if you're a Christian, your King James Bible. Okay, But uh, Paul says here that the written Word of God may have free course, and that it also may be glorified. Now, you know... Years ago, just to give you just a little bit of a word of testimony here, I spent a lot of time studying a lot of different things, a lot of the occult, um, witchcraft, Satanism, a lot of the conspiracy stuff, uh, Catholicism, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, just a lot of different things. The Bible version issue, the rapture issue, a lot of different things. And I kind of thought, now what would what would be the kind of thing that the Lord would have me spend my time on? What would be the main focus, or what should be the main focus of my life? I want to be in ministry. I want to serve the Lord. God's given me, you know, opened up a lot of uh, understanding and, and given me a lot of information. You know, I had to spend a lot of years studying and, and read a lot of books and everything else. Spent a lot of money down through the years. And I thought, you know, what should be the battlefield that I decide to fight in? And what I decided on was the Word of God, the battle over the Bible, the King James Bible versus all the others. 
And when I say all the others, of course, I'm not referring to other Bibles put out by Bible believers that precede the King James Bible or even foreign language Bibles that are derived from the Textus Receptus or from the Antioch line of manuscripts. I'm talking about the Alexandrian Roman Catholic New Versions. And um, that's what I'm against. Okay, And that's the cause that, like Paul, Paul wrote about that I will gladly spend and be spent. And um, he didn't mean about money either. He meant as far as his time and his health and everything else. And that's my cause. The cause that I am fighting for is, is I want to encourage people that they can have the Word of God in the English language in a perfect form in the King James Bible. You can carry around your King James Bible and know as a fact that it is God's holy word and the Holy Spirit will speak to you through the pages of the King James Bible. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to see the word of the Lord to have free course and I want to see it to be glorified. I praise God for this year. A lot of the secular media is actually glorifying the word of the Lord right now. They're celebrating and they're saying, well, I shouldn't say maybe maybe they're not celebrating, but at least they're giving honor to the fact that the King James Bible turns 400 years old this year, 1611 to 2011. And I'm thankful to see that the even the lost world is having to pay respect to the great book, the greatest book that ever showed up on this planet is the King James Bible. And that's not a, a matter of opinion. That's a matter of documented scientific fact no bible in the history of man has ever produced the kind of results um no bible no book has ever been printed and published as much as the king james bible never in history has there been a book like this book this king james bible and and i'll, I'll tell you what i just it amazes me you know i i studied church history and and back in Wycliffe's day before they had printing presses back in the 1300s um, they would have to write out pages of scripture and it would cost you I think it was like a year's salary almost to just buy a bible a written bible I mean it was incredibly expensive because it was very labor intensive I mean it took a lot of time to make a bible back then and, and today I think we take our King James Bibles for granted. You know, we don't really glorify the Word of God. We we don't realize the treasure that we have with our King James Bible. And I'll tell you, I I am just I feel like a, a rich man because I have not just one King James Bible, but I have many many King James Bibles. I give them out. And by the way, if you're listening and you're new to the Bible version issue. You can check out my other website, KingJamesVideoMinistries.com. I've got over a hundred free videos on there, and uh, we have a quite a few DVDs available on the Bible version issue subject. And if you don't have the money for a King James Bible, please feel free to get in contact with us here at Bible Believers Fellowship, and we will send you one at our cost. It won't cost you a thing. All it'll cost you is a little bit of time to just send us an email with your address, and we would be very happy to send you out a King James Bible. Okay, the greatest book that's ever showed up. So, I just want to take a little bit of time there to glorify the Word of the Lord. And the King James Bible certainly is the Word of God. I'm convinced of it. And you will be too if you start to read it and believe it. But let's continue here with our study of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Now, isn't that interesting? Paul identifies men who live without faith as being, quote, unreasonable and wicked. You see, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 38 and 39, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Right now, for you to be saved, you have to believe in a past event, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, 
you have to believe it by faith. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, but you can't see him. You can see the written record of God. You can see the proof from nature. The invisible things of the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. You know, it says there in Romans chapter 1, you can see proof from what God has created. You can see proof from the King James Bible. But when it comes right down to it, you have to live by faith. And so does everybody else, by the way. Don't believe this nonsense that evolution is science and that they've proven it with science. No, they haven't. Evolution, if, if there's an atheist out there and they say, oh, I refuse to believe by faith. Well, first of all, the Bible calls you here in Second Th Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, it calls you unreasonable and wicked. But secondly, they're lying. Every atheist out there has to have faith. You have faith that your car will start in the morning. That it's, that it's not going to blow up on you. You have faith that when you walk outside and you step on the street or something like that, that there isn't some kind of a, you know, whatever there. I mean, that you could trip over and fall out into traffic. Or when you have you sit on a chair or you walk onto a floor, you have faith that the chair and the floor are going to hold your weight. You live by faith all the time. But see, what's being condemned here in Second Thessalonians 3, 2 is... People that won't admit to living by faith. Everybody has to have faith in something. Okay? But there are people out there, I refuse to live by faith, you know. And, you know, I'll say this too. When it comes down to the belief in the Bible, you can see a lot, you can study a lot, but at the end of the day, it's going to come back to faith. God's not going to reveal everything to you from the Scriptures. And you're going to have to believe by faith. Okay, the pre-tribulation rapture, I've proved it time and time again from the scriptures, but at the end of the day, I will admit to you, it's by faith that I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back soon. You know, another place in scripture, it actually says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. You can't please God if you're walking around requiring that you see things by sight. You're not going to please God living like that. You have to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Remember that. But let's continue on here with our study. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Now remember, the unreasonable and wicked men are those that don't live by faith. Look at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. That's kind of interesting there. You don't have to worry about the Lord being unfaithful to you. Man will be unfaithful. God won't. Okay? Very interesting. And now notice the, the second part of that verse too, by the way. I just want to make a quick note here on that. Keep you from evil. The Lord will keep you from evil. That's kind of interesting. i got a question for you. Did you ever get behind a slow driver? You're really in a hurry to get somewhere and you get behind somebody and they're going like 10 miles an hour under the speed limit, you know, and it just drives you up a wall and finally you get out or from around them and you, you know, you're a couple minutes late to where you were supposed to be, you know, how often did you think to yourself, maybe the Lord did that to keep me from evil? I've had situations like that where somebody, something happened that I got slowed down, I didn't leave quite when I wanted to, or somebody pulls out in front of me and they go really slow. And I'll get to an intersection and I, and some truck goes right through the red light. You know, and it's green for me. And I think to myself, you know what, if I'd have been here five seconds earlier, that truck would have hit me. I had that happen a couple times now. You don't know... How many times, and you'll know probably in eternity, not probably, I'm sure you'll know in eternity, how many times the Lord kept you from evil. That's something, isn't it? And uh, you ought to try something next time you get behind a slow driver. You ought to pray and, and say, thank you, Lord. I don't know what your purpose is here. Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them which are the called according to his purpose. God's working together something for good out of that slow driver being in front of you. And you ought to thank him. You say, thank him for that? Well, the Bible says, in everything give thanks. 
in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. And, you know, that's one of those important things that you are to be thankful in all things. But we'll continue here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. Now, Paul here is exhorting them to both do, in other words, continue doing good right now, and that they will do, in other words, do good in the future, the things which they commanded them to do. So, in other words, Paul's saying to them, these instructions that we're giving you, that you're not going to have to go through this time of Jacob's trouble and everything else, we want you to stick with that. We want you to continue growing in faith and charity and everything else. We want you to continue doing that. And we want you to do it now. And we want you to continue doing that. You see, when they wrote to him the first time, they said, do those things. Here's the truth. This is the way it is. But the Thessalonian believers didn't continue in that. They started to doubt. They started to kind of fall back a little bit. And that's not what you should do as a Christian. You need to con you need to do good and also do good in the future. Continue in those things. Hold fast, as the Bible says. Look at verse 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Hmm. And uh, let me just say quick here, you better make sure that God is directing your life and not you yourself. Okay? Uh, another pretty familiar part, part of scripture here proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths now if you use a new version they pervert verse 6 there into saying that he will make your path straight that is a lie total lie god is not going to make your path straight okay Sometimes he will. Sometimes there's a problem ahead of you and God clears it out. Other times God says, no, I want you to go through this problem. I'm going to direct you through it. I'm going to take you up or down or to the left or to the right, but you need to go through this hard time and you'll come out better. Romans 8.28 again. Okay, God will direct your path if you are willing. Okay, there's a lot of times that you'll meet some kind of a hard time in your life or hardship in your life, and you just put your foot down and you say, I won't submit to God about this. And I'll tell you right now, God says, okay, stay there at that obstacle. I'm going to be over here. When you're ready for me to start directing your path again, let me know. But until then, you just stay there and work that thing out for yourself. <laughs> but now notice the second half of verse 5. It says there, and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now that's a little bit of a, of a rebuke that Paul gives to the Thessalonians. Why? Well, because they weren't being patient and waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. They weren't waiting for the rapture. They were giving up hope. Okay? You shouldn't do that. The blessed hope is going to happen. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, May 22nd, here in just a couple of weeks, if the Lord doesn't come back till then, there's going to be a couple million people who give up hope in the rapture because some wicked false prophet named Harold Camping has come out and he's lied to people and he said that the rapture is going to happen May 21st of 2011. Now what's going to happen when that doesn't come to pass is you're going to have all these people quitting and you're going to have the post-trib rapture thieves. They're going to throw a little party and they're going to say, Oh, see, we proved, we proved it's all a lie. These rapture, these pre-trib rapture people. Uh, let me just point out here really quickly. I don't want to go off on a big tangent here, but Harold Camping is not a pre-trib rapture believer. Harold Camping teaches that the tribulation has already happened. <laughs> okay, Harold Camping is a nut. He is a heretic, an extreme heretic. I mean, go onto his uh, website and look at his salvation message. It's heretical. Yeah, you know, really, really, really bad. He's a hyper Calvinist and just a bunch of other stuff. He's teaching that May twenty first is going to be Christ's second coming. I mean, the guy is warped. All right, don't fall for Harold Camping. But you need to be patient and wait for the rapture. 
Look at Second uh, Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Notice it's a command. Okay? And you're to withdraw, not from a lost person, but from a brother, somebody that's actually saved. That, And why should you re withdraw from? Number one, that walks because they walk disorderly. And number two, because they don't follow the tradition which Paul preached. Okay? It's right there. And you say, well, what's the tradition that Paul's preaching? Well, among other things, he was preaching a pre-tribulation rapture. He was preaching that there would come a falling away first, and then the man of sin would be revealed. And the man of sin is not going to be revealed until the body of Christ leaves. That's what Paul's preaching. So if a brother, even though they're saved, even though they're a Christian, if they come along and they bring that doctrine, this doctrine of you're going to, there is no rapture, there's no pre-trib rapture, you're going to go through God's wrath for seven years, and it's the second coming that you're looking for. If a brother has that position, you are to withdraw yourself from them. Just as simple as that. That's how big of a doctrine this is. It's a very important. And you say, well, I don't know. I'm not going to fight over it. Well, let me just explain something. I have seen this now time and time again, that those who begin to doubt the pre-tribulation rapture and start saying that Christians go through the tribulation, I've seen it many, many times that they will begin to get messed up I mean, tremendously messed up in doctrinal areas, other important doctrinal areas. It just, something happens to them. And they start falling apart doctrinally because basically you're saying Jesus is not going to remove his bride before God's wrath is poured out. And you run into so many problems with that. And it's been covered in other studies. I can't get into it here. But uh, we'll continue on here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we be behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. It wasn't that they weren't taking money, because you're not supposed to, you know, paid ministry is of the devil. No, that isn't it. Paid ministry is fine, and you can listen to our message on paid ministry. But there are times and places when you shouldn't take money. When you better, especially if you're dealing with false prophets, who most false prophets are too lazy to get a real job. And a real minister of Jesus Christ is not afraid of a little bit of work. Okay, I enjoy, you know, I it's kind of funny because sometimes I take off from the ministry so I can go out and do physical labor. Uh, otherwise, I start getting pretty weak and, and out of shape. But a, a real minister should never be afraid of doing a little bit, you know, of getting his hands dirty. Um, but notice it says there about how that, you know, you, you or yourselves know how you ought to follow us. And, you know, he goes down through there and basically says, we proved things to you. Really, the Thessalonians had no excuse for doubting Paul and for being deceived by these false prophets. They could clearly see that Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus were the real deal. So that's just one more warning where be careful about some of these false prophets. A lot of them are lazy. And we're going to see that as we continue. Let's look at Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat, or neither should he eat, if you want to say it that way. And I'll tell you right now, one of the distinguishing characteristics of a false prophet is that they don't like physical labor. And I'm going to be getting into this a little bit more. Like I said earlier, this Vissarian guy over in Russia, he goes around saying that he's Christ, and he just sits around in his mountaintop home 
which he has solar energy and he's got ATVs and stuff that he can cruise around on and he and he's up there and he's making oil paintings and he's doing all this stuff and they said that he doesn't do any work any physical labor <laughs> I thought yeah uh-huh that's about accurate you know Jim Jones did the same thing you see video of Jim Jones he's just kind of hanging out there at his place out in California that they had before they went to Africa I believe it was and you know all the people are doing the work and he's just kind of walking around doing whatever he feels like doing that's how false prophets do things and Paul was not that way um, and Paul makes it very clear that if anyone doesn't work they shouldn't be given food and it's kind of interesting here because America disobeyed this command when they brought in their welfare system. And welfare is not right. I don't believe that there's any justification for it. You say, well, Brian, what about a single mother with children and things? Well, you know, if she has a desire to work and, and I mean, first of all, why is she in that situation? I mean, I know that there are some young women that, that really fall in love with some kind of guy and the guy, you know, impregnates impregnates them and then he takes off i know that that happens i know that it happens more often than it should but the fact of the matter is if she was you know she, if she's the right kind of a girl she should have waited for the right kind of a guy you know first of all but secondly you know a, uh, if you have a really good situation like that of a, of a young lady or or anybody that really needs to be helped it should be the responsibility of the church, not the government. And if you see, hey, this person's willing to work, you know, they can come and they can work here or there or something like that, we'll provide food for them. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's just, you know, if you don't work, you shouldn't be eating. And a lot of these people on the welfare system, they just sit around and watch TV or go hang out at the mall or whatever. They're not working. They shouldn't be eating. Just as simple as that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. And I just want to make a comment here quick. Notice the word disorderly of uh, verses 6 and 7. You see it there in verses 6 and 7. It shows up again here in verse 11. And, you know, you don't want to go off the deep end here as far as a Christian ordering their life, but a Christian's life should be ordered. You shouldn't be disorderly. Okay, you shouldn't just get up and do whatever and eat whatever and work whenever. <clears throat> there should be order to your life as a Christian. Okay, you're to redeem the time because the days are evil, the Bible says. There's a lot of work that you need to do down here for the Lord, and you aren't going to be able to do it in an efficient way unless your life is ordered. Okay, just the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but what is a busybody? It says there about, but are busybodies. The end of verse 11. Well, if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11 through 15, it says, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. It doesn't mean damnation eternally there. It means basically that they... We're serving the Lord, and now they've cast that off. They've gone, they've gotten married, they get worldly, and it messes them up. Okay, look at verse 13. And with all they learn to be idle, or not working, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. You know, that's what happens to some of these women. They begin to be idle. They don't, they're not a keeper at home. They don't take care of their house, which God's given them as a responsibility. And they go out from house to house and they begin to be tattlers and busybodies. You know, that's a sin. If you're a woman in a church and you start to go out and gossip with the other women and, oh, I want to come over and visit and we'll have a little bit of tea and gossip, you know, <laughs> a little bit of gossip on the side, that's a sin. You shouldn't be doing that. 1 Timothy 5, verses 14 and 15, what should you be doing? It says here in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, 
Guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. That's what happens when you have a woman that isn't working. Okay, working around the house, guiding the house. She can fall into some serious sin. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. Now them that are such, we command them that are such. Who's that? Well, the women. These busybodies and tattlers. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. You know, the Bible talks about a woman, a, a godly woman, being having shamefacedness and sobriety. Shamefacedness is another way of saying bashfulness. Women are not supposed to be loud and mouthing off people. and That's not the kind of, of a woman that God likes. You know, they can get saved, whatever. There are loudmouth Christian women, but it's dishonorable in God's sight. Okay? A good Christian woman should work quietly, and men too, by the way. I'm not, I'm not trying to single out just women here. Men can gossip just as much as women. But they should work quietly and eat their own bread. Okay, they should be a keeper at home. A woman should be a keeper at home. And she shouldn't be going around to her neighbor's houses for tea and gossip, as I said earlier. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. We'll continue on here. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You know, it can be weary sometimes waiting on the Lord to come. You know, I know a lot of brethren that are just sick and tired of this world and want to leave today. You know, and I'm one of them. But let me just say this. If others are messed up and not willing to be corrected, then you make sure that your own life is right before God. Okay. Don't be weary in well-doing. Don't, don't fall for the sheep mentality of, well, everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is quitting on the pre-trib rapture. You know, everybody else is using new versions. So I guess I should too. Don't do that. That's not right. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. There's my two favorite verses in the, in the entire Bible. Uh, because it reminds you that you are at war down here. You are at war with three things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh is your own, by the way. Uh, it's pretty rough. And your flesh is going to want you to quit. Your flesh doesn't like to be the outsider. Your flesh doesn't like to be made fun of. But you're just going to have to go through that. Why? Well, because it's suffering for the Lord and for His call. And the Lord will pay you back for that. Okay, with millennial reign and, and rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Another place here, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. It says here, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. says the same thing as there in Second Thessalonians 3.13. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It's important that you faint not. Don't quit on the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Remember that. And like I said, May 22nd, when it comes around this year, if the Lord doesn't come before then, there's going to be a lot of people who faint. A lot of people that are going to quit on the pre-tribulation rapture and say, see, it's been debunked. No, it hasn't. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Okay, so you see it there again. You are to withdraw yourself from those people that do not believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. That's just the way it is. Okay, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, what was the main focus of the epistle about? It was about Paul trying to, to convince them that they're not going to have to go through the tribulation time period. That's what Second Thessalonians, the main focus of the whole book, is about. So if anybody doesn't obey that, 
You're to note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. You meet somebody who's into this post-trib rapture stuff, or no no rapture at all, some even teach that now, don't have anything to do with them. Okay? You're not to keep company with them. And you say, well, why not? I don't understand that. Well, because they'll mess you up. And I've seen that many, many times. You can't take continual assaults on your faith, on your belief system. Don't listen to them. You see somebody, oh, I believe we're going to go through the tribulation. You just, oh, whatever. You know, I just, don't even listen to them. Don't waste time on them. But look at verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 3.15 says, Yet count him not as an, as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay, the rule there in Scripture is that a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Okay, and I will treat saved people like they are heretics sometimes that are messed up doctrinally. You get some of these people that are radically anti-King James Bible, or you get these post-trib rapture people. Uh, I don't count them as an enemy, and I try, but I do try to admonish them as a brother, and if they won't take it, if they are just totally unresponsive, if there's no thought going into it, they're just, they hate the rapture theory, and they hate the King James Bible, I just say, okay, thank you, goodbye, and I leave them alone. That's the best way to do it. And many of these post-trib rapture people are saved, I do believe that, they're just messed up doctrinally. And that's why you should stay away from them because they'll, it'll start rubbing off on you. Be careful about that. Okay, a couple more verses here and then we're done with this study. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. Okay, you should have peace in this life. And Isaiah 48, verse 22 says, There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. And that's very true for today. And it's going to be especially true for those who miss the rapture. Okay, those who receive not the love of the truth. God's going to send them strong delusion that they might be damned. That's some serious, you know, bad news there. You can't have peace without Jesus Christ. It just isn't going to happen. Last two verses here, and then we're done. Uh, 2 Thessalonians three seventeen and 18. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, in closing here, I just want to say, no matter what happens, do not let anyone talk you out of believing that Jesus will take his bride away before God pours out his wrath and judgment for seven years. Don't let anybody talk you out of the pre-tribulation rapture. If you aren't sure and you have some questions, please listen to my pre-trib rapture studies. If I didn't answer something in there, get in contact with me. I've answered most of the arguments either in the pre-trib rapture series or in the post-trib rapture thieves, parts 1, 2, and 3. Okay, I've answered a lot of the, the attacks there. I've studied this issue for a very long time. Another point I want to make is, on May 22nd, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to lose faith in the rapture because of Harold Camping, because of his false predictions. I don't even want to call it a prophecy, because it's, you know, I don't want people thinking he's a prophet, he's a false prophet. But there's going to be a lot of people who are going to lose faith in the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, make sure you're not one of them, Okay. Harold Camping is not calling for the pre-tribulation rapture. He's calling for the post-tribulation second coming of Jesus Christ. The guy is off his rocker, okay? He's nuts. I mean, even if the Lord would come back on May 21st, even if he would come back on that day, it's not going to be what Harold Camping says it's going to be. Jesus is not going to physically come down to the earth. Watch out for that stuff. Now remember, too, that you are commanded to withdraw yourself from those who teach that the body of Christ is going to go through the Great Tribulation. You are commanded to withdraw yourself from those people. Okay, don't waste your time on false prophets. You see these people, they start talking about, oh, the, the 
you know, pre-trib rapture is a lie, dispensationalism is a lie, we have the sign gifts for today, don't even waste your time on them, you know, you, you know, you see that kind of thing, just like, whatever, and they say, well, you have to answer me, no, you don't, you don't have to look at all sides, and you don't have to answer every argument that comes to you, somebody doesn't bring the Bible doctrines that you've learned, somebody doesn't bring them to you, if they have an arrogant spirit, if they if they really honestly want to know, okay, that's different. But if they have an arrogant, unteachable spirit, don't waste time on them, okay? Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words, it says back in the book of Proverbs. Don't speak into the ears of a fool. You're just wasting your time. Now I want to read two more verses here from Revelation, and then we're going to be done with this study. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 20 through 21. It says here, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that's going to conclude our study of Second Thessalonians chapters 1, 2, and 3. A lot of scripture to go through there. If you made it the whole way through the study, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for enduring to the end. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, things are heating up. I mean, it's just incredible anymore. You know, I have a friend that, that we've been um, meeting together about every other week now for years and years and years. He's uh, We went to high school together and... You know, back years ago, I mean, I'm not that old, but I can remember things being a lot different years ago. And and now we often joke about how that it just seems like major world events, major cataclysms and and amazing things. And it's not happening once a week anymore. It's every couple of days. And you just think, you know, what's next? What's next? What's next? You know, is there going to be some massive earthquake? Is there going to be another nuclear uh, power plant exploding? Or, you know, is, is there going to be another terrorist attack? Or, or who knows what? And you keep wondering in, your, in yourself, I wonder what day it's going to be. I wonder when it happens. What am I going to be doing when I hear that sound, the voice of the Trump that says, Come up hither. I wonder what you're going to be doing. I wonder that for myself. It's really something to think about. But I can tell you this. You know, when you run a race and you see the finish line up ahead, you can see it in the distance and or you can hear the, the sounds of the crowd that's gathered at the finish line. You know it's coming. You know that the end is near of the race that you have to run. You don't slow down. You don't say, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna quit the race. I'm just gonna kinda sit here along the, along the race track, you know. You don't do that. You know what you do? You get a second wind and you run harder. And I'm gonna tell you right now, we are seeing the shaping of the coming kingdom of Antichrist. It's speeding up at just it is amazing how fast this thing is coming about. And just seeing Scripture being fulfilled, fulfilled on a daily basis. It's incredible. You don't have much more of a race to run. And I can tell you that most of you out there that are hearing my voice right now, unless you die an unnatural death, most of you are going to see the rapture. I firmly believe it. It can't keep going on the way it is right now. So... Run the race with patience, yes, but speed up your efforts, okay? You don't have much longer to run this race. If you haven't ever put out tracks or you haven't ever witnessed to people, make an effort to do that. If you're not suffering much for Jesus Christ, well, start taking some stands. The suffering will come, okay? You don't have to make yourself suffer. It'll come when you start doing right. When you start living right. But I really don't think there's much time left. And I know people, he always says that. Yep. 
Mm -hmm. But God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God hasn't flipped the switch yet to start the tribulation, the switch being that the body of Christ is taken out of here. The Lord hasn't done that yet because there are still some people that he'd like to see saved. There are still some people that he needs to give the opportunity to. But you see, the more people that reject Jesus Christ, the closer we get to God's wrath being poured out and the closer we get to the body of Christ leaving. And like I said, I really don't see it going much longer. So that's going to be it for this study. And I thank you for listening. And as always, if you have questions or ideas for other sermons that we haven't ever preached on, get in contact with us. So that's it. Thank you for listening.